So it's Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, as we, we come and uh, we look at this passage this morning, Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. We pray that your word would pierce us, convict us, comfort us, and Lord, that we would be ever more enamored by your glory by your goodness, by your kindness, and by the gifts that you have given to us as gifts of grace. Father, thank you for your word and bless our time in it this morning, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Titus 3 and verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Saviour appeared... And the but here, obviously, is a contrast. We we hate taking passages out of context, as you guys know. We, we, We make it our practice to go verse by verse through entire books. Everything is always in its context, but we've, we've jumped in here for this Christmas service, and so the but there means that we've got to look back a little bit, and he talks in verse 3 about how we were once foolish, disobedient, led astray. We were slaves to various passions and pleasures. We are passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And so it is that the life apart from Christ is a life that while outwardly may look uh, acceptable and even moral in many cases, that what we are doing apart from Christ is we're operating in one nature. It is our nature to sin. It is our nature to be selfish. And even the best of us apart from Christ are operating out of our sinful hearts. There isn't a choice in the matter. We are bound to our master sin. And without the redemption, the payment of Christ and his blood to free us from sin, that is where we remain. But the bad news aside, the good news is our focus this morning. And here with the but, we have the contrast, but which is, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. And so it is, Uh, that with Christmas what we have is we have the arrival of the Saviour. This is what we saw last night in our message that this is the one who brings salvation. As uh, Simeon said when he lifted up that month-old baby at his purification ceremony, he said, my eyes have seen your salvation. And the name Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua, means salvation. And that's what he is and that's what he's brought and so really verse 4 is a Christmas verse it's talking about the first appearing of our salvation now what is interesting here is that this appearing of our Savior uh, it comes but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared so the coming of Christ is something that is tied up with the goodness and the loving kindness of God. Now those words, obviously are words that to an extent we can understand. We understand that God is good. We understand his loving kindness, his love towards us. But these words are far more than that. These are covenant words. These are the words that God in the past, in the Old Testament, used to describe himself to Israel. Now, you don't need to turn there as well unless you want to, but I'm going to briefly read to you one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I must have read it to you about five or six times in sermons already, and I'll probably do it a whole bunch more, because it is a central passage in the whole of Scripture. And that is in Exodus chapter 34, where uh, Moses, um, being 
greedy, but in a good way, the man who had seen more of God's glory than any other person on the planet, that he said to God, show me your glory. And so God reveals himself to Moses and his glory passes Moses by. And as Moses is there, and the Lord is protecting him in the cleft of the mountain, we have in verse 5, the uh, God revealing his glory to Moses. It says, The Lord, that's Yahweh, descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And so God, in revealing himself to Moses, it's not just a light show, it's not just Raiders of the Lost Ark, glory of God passing by, hiding behind the rock so your face isn't burnt off. There is more to it than this. There is, Yahweh says, this is the proclaiming of Yahweh. This is the revelation of who I am. You see me, you see my glory, you see my character. And so, verse 6, Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who by no means, uh, who, by, who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And so God there is revealing himself in his covenant that he had with Israel. And right there at the center is this covenant is on the basis of who I am. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, steadfast love, faithfulness. And when that passage is translated into Greek, in the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, we find the same words that we find here in Titus chapter 3. This is the covenant-keeping nature of God. And you know what is interesting is in all of the New Testament gospel passages dealing with the birth of Christ, they're all linking Jesus to the Old Covenant, to the Old Testament promises. One little thing here at the end is that we see God's desire to forgive and to bring forgiveness of sin. But because it's the old covenant, we see not only the necessity of him to punish sin, but we see the old covenant way of that sin having an effect on future generations. One of the things about the new covenant that Jeremiah told us when he prophesied it would come is that that would then cease and each man would be responsible for his own sins. And so it is this new covenant that is given by the same covenant-keeping God. The loving kindness, the goodness of God that gave us the old covenant is now more fully expressed in the new covenant. Remember we read in our carol service last night, John chapter 1. And we're told in John 1, and lest I misquote it, let me just turn there very briefly. But in John 1, we read, uh, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. That's the incarnation right there. John 1, 14. The word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us and we have seen his glory. And for John, the glory is always the glory of the cross. The glory of God's character, Exodus 34, being revealed through the cross. I could get lost in John 1 here. I'll try not to. Um, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And again, grace and truth are covenantal terms pointing us back to Exodus 34. Exodus 34 is the foundation for John 1. Full of grace and truth. And so... God's character expressed to Moses was shown. Moses saw more of God's glory than anyone had seen before. What John is saying in John 1 is we, through the cross of Christ, have seen more glory than Moses saw. We have seen the fullest revelation of grace and truth. And then in verse 16, and from his fullness, that fullness of grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace. Literally in the Greek, grace in place of grace. 
So God, by his grace, gave the old covenant, and now in place of that, there is a fuller expression of grace in the new covenant. And that's what Titus is, uh, what Paul is referring to in Titus 3 here. He's saying that, and this will become clearer in the next verse, but he's saying that when the goodness and loving kindness of God, the character of God, our Savior, appeared, that is the character of God that has been true throughout Scripture. The character of God never changes, but the covenant has changed. And in the appearing of this, in its fullest sense, in Christ, he saved us. And this is the salvation that is promised in Christ, the salvation that Simeon rejoiced in. The salvation of the new covenant comes because of the goodness and loving kindness of God. Because God is, as he revealed himself to be to Moses, he sent us Christ, he sent us his Son, God incarnate with us, that we might be saved. Now, here is the basis of that salvation. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. And this is the centerpiece of the Christian message. The coming of Christ at Christmas is in the incarnation, is a picture that is carried right the way through the gospel message. The concept of us not working for our salvation, us not earning our salvation, is seen in the manger at Christmas. That here is God come to us. Here is God with us. And he comes not out of some deserved effort, but he comes at a time that is so unexpected. We saw in Luke 2 last night how the offering for purification that Mary and Joseph made was the offering in Exodus 13 that was for poor people only. They couldn't afford a lamb. That's why they offered up those doves as a sacrifice for the purification ceremony. And he came at a time when nobody was earning him or doing anything. He came in weakness. He came in humility. And the incarnation, to me, uh, speaks of uh, the grace of God, the lack of, uh, of uh, work for salvation, because it is the most humble of gifts. The thing I will never get my head around with regards to the Incarnation is this. In Colossians 1, we're told about Christ and how Christ created everything and how he holds the whole universe together. Now, there are things about the universe that we just simply don't understand. In, in its um, extent, a breadth, as it were, how far out it goes, but also more inwardly in the sense of the smallest molecules. And I'm no scientist and I don't understand it, but what I do know is this. I know that Christ created it all. Atoms, electrons, and quarks, and whatever else, and stars and galaxies far afield. But Christ created it all, and Christ holds it all together. That so much of the universe is, uh, is affected by the, the concept of time. And yet time itself is something that Christ created. And then Christ, having created the universe on the subatomic level, on the breadth and extent of it, having created it all, holding it all together, creating time, then at a moment in time becomes part of creation. And doesn't just become king, doesn't just come to rule and to reign, but comes as a fetus, just as vulnerable as vulnerable can be. How do you go from glory to that? That, that is the picture of humility. And when we see that, the idea that we who were created can do anything for our Creator, that we can work or we can earn our salvation. It, it just, it's just nonsensical. It's ridiculous. 
We can't do anything to earn, so he had to come to us. And that step, I mean, honestly, the more I understand scripture, the more I realize the step of incarnation, the step from glory to humility, that step is greater than we will ever, ever understand. And that was a step that was necessary downwards because it's not possible for there to be any step upwards. We can't earn our way to him. That's why he had to come down to us, to our level, to come and be with us. As we will sing in a moment, pleased as man with man to dwell. As a man, he comes to be with men. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. God with us in human flesh. So he didn't save us because of our righteousness, but he did so according to his own mercy. The reason that he saves us, the reason that he sent his son for us, is mercy. Why be merciful? Because he's a God of mercy. That's who he is. That's his character. That's his goodness. That's his loving kindness. That the God who is sovereign is also a God who is good and a God who is merciful is one of the most wonderful truths in the whole of Scripture. All that power and all that majesty and every last bit of it saturated in goodness and mercy. Just a wonderful thing. And so, salvation doesn't come by us being good or us doing stuff. It comes on the basis of God's mercy. And it happens by the washing of regeneration. And again, he uses uh, terms that the Bible has used in the Old Testament to speak of the coming new covenant. This is picking up on John's Gospel and God, John using the concept of water to speak of the Spirit of God cleansing us from our sin. And so it is that we are washed uh, and regenerated through that washing and then we have the renewal, the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And so that picture of water and the Spirit in, in regeneration and renewal is an old covenant picture from Ezekiel that John picks up and runs with in John's Gospel, where we, in our sinful state, when God saves us and He regenerates us and cleans us, He does so through the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll come back to that, but let's just finish off this, this train of thought. The Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly. Now, we saw, and this is how I'm trying to link these sermons together a little bit. We saw last night how Simeon had the Spirit of God upon him. And there were very, very, very few people who had the Spirit of God upon them. Just a few kings, a few judges, and the prophets. The Spirit of God came upon them. Generally speaking, God was with his people in the tabernacle. God was with Israel because there in the wilderness is the tabernacle, and in the tabernacle, God in his glory dwells. And then, when the, the temple was built, 1 Kings chapter uh, 6 or 8, I think, the, the, the glory, just like in the Exodus in chapter 40, the glory of God comes in at the completion of the temple, as it did at the completion of the tabernacle, and God dwells in the temple in the Holy of Holies. And that's where he is, so he's with his people. But a very few people, Moses, David, Samson, Gideon, very few people would have the Spirit of God upon them and in them. And sometimes that's, the Spirit would then leave them, like Saul. Saul had the Spirit of God upon him and he did great things for God. And then he sinned and God took his Spirit from him. And that's why David, Saul's successor, was so scared when he was caught in sin. And his psalm of repentance, he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. He's petrified because that's what had happened to Saul in his sin. And David in that psalm, he longed for a time when people would have the Holy Spirit. And Joel prophesied it would happen. He said, in the last days I'll pour my Spirit out on all people. 
your sons and daughters, old men, young men, even slave girls. And you know what? In the old covenant, God was with his people in the temple and tabernacle. But there were these few examples, like Simeon last night in Luke 2, who the Spirit of God came upon. But under the new covenant, the Spirit of God is poured out on all kinds of people. It's not just the kings. It's not just the rulers and the judges and the prophets. Every single one of us. We no longer have a temple or a tabernacle because as Christians, we are the tabernacle and the temple. And that's what he's speaking about here. He's saying, when you've been saved, this covenant-keeping God who made covenants throughout the Bible, in this final new covenant, he has not just saved us, he has washed us by the Spirit that he's poured out upon us. You see, this is where the miracle of Christmas goes to. It's not just to us having um, sins forgiven, but it's about us having a relationship with Christ that is like the relationship that God had with Moses. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God has been poured out on us, and Him coming washes us clean from our sin. That's our salvation. So the Spirit of God upon each one of us poured out. We have the Spirit of God under the new covenant, and we become cleansed by Him from our sin. And how does this happen? Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus came, he was incarnated and born. We have the circumcision at eight days, the purification at 40 days. We then have him in the temple after t at the age of 12 or 13, and we see him grow. We, we've told of him growing up, and then his ministry begins, and he fulfills the old covenant, and he goes to his death on the cross, and as he dies on the cross, Matthew's gospel tells us, that, at, and Mark's gospel as well, that when, that when that death happens, the temple curtain is torn in two. We've been doing our studies in Mark's gospel, and we see how at the beginning of his ministry, at the baptism, the heavens are literally the text says, torn open at the start of his ministry. At the end of his ministry, the temple curtain is torn open. A tearing, sandwiching his ministry. Because with his death, that sacrificial system of the old covenant was completed. It was done. It wasn't failed, it was fulfilled. And so, the sacrifices that used to have to be made for sin no longer had to be made. Because Christ, our Passover lamb, well, we're jumping from Christmas to Easter now, but Christ, our Passover lamb, he is the one sacrifice that is sufficient for all people for all time. And that salvation that Simeon saw, I've seen, my eyes have seen salvation, that salvation comes through his death. And that not by works that we do, but through faith in him, that sacrifice is then applied to us. The Spirit of God is given to us, and we're cleansed from our sin. And that's what the next verse says. So that being justified, we are justified before God. We're declared to be righteous. Listen. I know this is old hat to most of you, but this is really the center gift of Christmas and we need to just have this in our hearts, we need to be absolutely certain on this, that when you have I don't know, a kid who's desperately wanting something they don't have, and then at Christmas the presents opened and a child who's been wanting something all year, they open up and they get that gift that they want and their eyes light up and, oh wow, this is, you know, this is wonderful. It's a great thing. There's something wonderful about the giving of gifts. There's one, something wonderful about the giving of gifts at other times when they're not expected. Giving beyond uh, 
times of expectation like Christmas and birthdays. There's something wonderful about giving because it's in the very nature and character of God and we're created in the image of God. And so it's a wonderful thing to give. But here's the deal. We can accumulate as many gifts as we like. We can get everything that we want. And yet, our lives are a breath. The years just pass by, and after we are gone, there's another generation. And unless the Lord comes back, there'll be another and another and another. And we will go from being remembered to, by many to remembered by a few, and then they'll be gone. And our life's but a breath. And the only gift that really matters is the gift of salvation. Because when it's over, it's over. This life, but eternity begins. Simeon last night, when we studied that passage, spoke of the consolation of Israel. And there is consoling of broken people in Christ. There is there are those who weep who will be consoled through the gift of Christ. The problem is, so often, that people don't weep. They don't see, verse 3, the state of their heart. We ourselves were foolish and disobedient. They don't weep over their separation from God. Now, I'm not the typical, um, you know, street corner soapbox kind of preacher, you know, as you know, but I, I hope we would pray this Christmas season that there would be opportunities this Christmas, this coming year, that we would give the one true gift, the gift of salvation. When people wanted to come to God in the past, in Old Testament times, they had to go to the temple because that's where God was. The psalmist would say, let's all go up to Zion. Let's go worship the Lord. Let's go to the temple where God dwells. Let's go to God. But now, because of the pouring out of the Spirit who, who regenerates us and washes us and cleanses us from our sin, because of that pouring out of the Holy Spirit, we're now the temple. That's why Jesus, when he breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit in John's Gospel, he's, he's symbolizing the giving of the Holy Spirit that will come at Pentecost. And he, he's saying, he then says to them, when you forgive sin, it's forgiven. Why is that? Have they got some amazing authority? No, it's because... Because with the giving of the Holy Spirit, we become the temples of God and we become the place that people come to meet God, to receive God, to receive salvation. Because we are where they hear the gospel message. And so people are justified, they're declared to be righteous because of God's grace and that's the gift that we have for Christmas. We can't have a Christmas message that leaves Jesus in the manger. We have to see the salvation that he came to bring. So that be, be, by being justified by his grace, we might become heirs. Heirs. Those who inherit according to the hope of eternal life. Listen. For many people, your parents will give you presents every year. But the biggest present that most people ever get from their parents is the present they get when their parents pass. Their par parents will typically leave for their children, you know, their home, their belongings, and, and what have you. And they will leave those things afterwards. And for us as Christians, we are heirs to what God will give us. And there is this gift that is coming. The hope of eternal life. That we receive because 
John 1, again, we've been given the right to become children of God. To those who believe, he gave the right to become children of God. We as children of God are his heirs, and we get his inheritance. And he is a wealthy God, full of riches of grace. You see, there is the baby in the manger. There is him bringing us salvation through the cross. But the end of the story is the hope of eternal life. Hope, of course, in the Bible does not mean hope as in, oh, I hope it will happen. Hope means assurance. We have the assurance of eternal life. And we are justified, because we're justified by God's grace, by his goodness, by his kindness, because we become washed, because we become his children, because we become temples of God, we have this assurance of eternal life. One last thing about Christmas. For many people, Christmas is a time of happiness, of joy, of celebration. But um, Stephen and Caroline were saying this morning how they uh, got hindered on the way here by having to give a statement following a case of reckless driving. It wasn't them, by the way, just for the record. But there was somebody who was uh, clearly high on some kind of narcotic. And Christmas is the time of the greatest cases of, if we can put it loosely, self-medication. Christmas is one of the highest times for things like suicide. Christmas is a time of incredible loneliness. Christmas is a time for many of joy, but for many it's a time where all the brokenness and the hurt is simply magnified. And we can relate to that. All of us, even in the midst of joy, because we all have brokenness. And when we look at the humble baby Christ, mild he lay, humility, lying there with all his glory set aside, when we see him humbled further by the cross, we then after that see that he who was born in humility, he who died, was raised to the right hand of the Father and given glory above all others and authority above every name and every authority and every power and every principality. And so with that brokenness of Christ, we see the future glory that he was then given. For those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who are temples of Christ, for those of us whom his spirit indwells, though there is brokenness now, though there is sin and sickness, failing bodies, broken hearts, loss, damage, the hope, the assurance we have is that we will be with him face to face in his glory. You see, when Simeon held that baby, and oh boy, that was fun looking at that last night, but when he held that baby, my eyes have seen your salvation. There's, there's faith in that because that baby, in as much as it, it's a baby, doesn't bring salvation. But the baby grows, the baby dies on the cross, the baby is exalted. And that exaltation leads to our salvation. And our salvation will ultimately lead to our glorification. And Simeon knew that. He knew that this baby was the beginning of a journey. In fact, a journey that had started long ago but a journey that was going to be complete with glorification. And so, in verses 4 to 7, which, by the way, is structured in the Greek like poetry. It's, almost, it's a hymn. People would have, would have probably sung this. Paul's probably quoting a hymn at this point. And he says afterwards in verse 8, this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on things. We have in verses 4 to 7 a neat little package of what God has done for us in Christ. 
It is my hope and my prayer, but amongst the gifts, that we would remember the great gift. That Christ came incarnate, that he died in our place, punished for our sins, lived the righteous life that we could never live, so that our righteousness is exchanged for his true righteousness. Our brokenness is exchanged for his completeness. And our sin is put upon his shoulders. And that we as his children, as God's heirs, would have the assurance of future glorification. That's the gift that we have. That's the gift that we have to share. And it's my hope and it's my prayer that this Christmas we would be asking God for opportunities to share and we would be meditating on our hearts on the gift that we've received. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your gift of Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would bless the rest of our Christmas, that you would minister to us each, Lord, that there would be, there would be joy in this day. And Lord, I do pray that in this day, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, in the months, and in the coming year, Lord, that we would have the opportunity to share this gift of salvation with others. Let us remember what it's all about. Amen.